Well, good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to an, another edition of Beverly's Times Past. With us this evening, we have our retired deputy fire chiefs from the Beverly Fire Department back with us for their fourth visit in a series looking back at the old days and the history of, of the Beverly Fire Department. And I'm very pleased to have with us uh, this evening Mr. John M. Briefy on my far right. Mr. Robert May in the middle here, and Mr. William McPherson. All of them are retired deputy fire chiefs, and all of them having retired in the 1980s decade. And I dare say it probably feels pretty good to be retired at this point in time. <laughs> uh, we're going to start this evening looking back at a little bit of the earlier history of the department uh, as we come to our, into our fourth uh, program. We want to talk more about what the modern day department is all about. But you fellows brought along some uh, very nice pictures here, and we'll get to those right away. First of which, we have here uh, in front of us a, a picture of the dispatcher, who in this case happened to be Daniel Hurley, whose time down at the Central Station, I believe, was in the mid-50s up through 1964 or 5 when he retired. And uh, we have a couple of nice pictures here of Dan at work. Uh, can you tell us something a little bit about the function of, of the dispatcher, Bill, uh, what, what his job was all about? Well, Dan was up there with uh, George Paff, Frank Doopey. Ben Murray. <laughs> ben Murray. Uh, <laughs> Murray. And uh, Adam ben, Rickey. Adam came in. Yeah, later on. Uh, anyway, uh, back in those days, uh, they had a telephone switchboard and uh, they'd receive the calls. Uh, they had what we called hotlines. In other words, if you had an emergency of any sort, uh, they would drop everything else and, and handle those emergency lines that were coming in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they, uh, when the station was first opened there, they had the, the uh, well, a vocal line unit at fire alarm, but they didn't bother to connect it up to the s other stations. Mm -hmm. And it took quite a few years before we could get the mayor and the board to uh, get the money together and uh, so that we could communicate vocally yeah. to the stations. Yeah. Uh, prior to that time, <clears throat> if the uh, fire or the emergency was, we'll say, Rouse Side, North Beverly of the Farm, said they'd ring the the telephone about seven or eight times, and they fellows in the station knew that they had to run. They were on their yeah. on their way. But uh, once the vocal line was installed, why uh, all the details were given the the location and what the incident it was about, whether it was a fire or medical emergency or a car accident or whatever. Right. But uh, John, these uh, these were the days before computers, which I, I guess so. I would assume perhaps they're using to a degree down there today. Oh, Ed, that's the nerve center. The dispatcher was the nerve center of the, of the department. They uh, was, had to be very important to get the right message so they can transfer it to the apparatus that are responding. They had a card in front of them that told them who to send or what area to go to. Uh -huh. yeah. And I suppose, Bob, it would help if they knew the city forward and backward as yeah, far think, as geography yeah, was concerned, yeah. Yeah, that was where the streets were. Pretty requisite. Yeah. Because they were the ones that, uh, they pointed you in the right direction, told you where to go. If they were wrong, they threw off the whole procedure. Right, right. I believe one of the fellows today working down there, he may have succeeded dead as Bob Battis. Is that right? Uh, that's, no? that's right. One yeah. of the dispatchers today. Bob uh, is really in the computers there, and he has uh, brought fire alarm up. Surely. A long ways from yeah. what it used to be. We're indebted to him on this series of programs of, so, for some of the notes that he's provided to us, and we, we appreciate that, uh, Mr. Battis. Now, uh, Bob May, you brought along uh, rather an interesting picture, which is right in back of you. And uh, you have some names, I believe, of the fellows who may have represented what this fellow here is standing for looking out at us here. Otis Butler, I believe his name is. Yeah. Well, let me tell you how I found him. It was one of those dull days in the fire station, nothing to do, so I crawled up through a hatchway into the attic and amongst the uh, old harnesses and old furniture that was thrown up there, I found this picture. 
and I took it home and cleaned it up, and on the back, written in pencil, were a bunch of names. I could hardly make them out, but with a magnifying glass, I did. And the first name that tops the list was Otis Butman, who died in 1900. So I believe that picture is Mr. Butman, uh -huh. a young, nice-looking young man in his fire uniform. And under his name was Augustus Marcy, who died in 1902, Asa Osborne, 1922, Azor Roundy, 1922, George Stanley, 1923, Fred Stanley, 1934, Ben Morgan in 1934, and Edwin Appleton in 1936. Okay, now are we looking and at they were all Centerville. Centerville, continue. Centerville names, and some of them are still uh, prominent up there. The Roundies and the Elliots and Stanleys. Stanleys, for sure. Yeah. Well, that picture is and certainly priceless. Bill's got uh, some old-time right. firefighters from uh, down yeah. his area, Betty. I'm going to hold this up, Steve, and hopefully we could get a close-up of this. Uh, if it's possible, and Bill, could you read those names here of what we're, well, what we're is, looking uh, at here? Old Hose 2 down the corner of Rain Tool and School Street, and it shows the uh, hose wagon. And uh, the boy standing on top is Arthur Brown. He, later on in life, he had the nickname Mecca Brown because he, when he was a young fellow, used to smoke Mecca cigarettes. Now, uh, sitting in the uh, the body of the hose wagon, first fellow in the end, looks like one of the Wittenhagens. The next fellow I don't know. The third fellow is James McPherson, my grandfather. Next to him is Davy Lynch, and the driver is one of the Callies. Standing down below, I think this is Jim Callie on the end. Next fellow I don't know, Captain Brown, Bill Rich, Dick Hafey, and Lieutenant Ed Hafey. Bill Rich married uh, the Hafey brother's uh, sister, and he later transferred to the hose company over Ryle's side. He uh, opened up uh, his own uh, grocery store oh, yeah, over there. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah, he did. But the Hafey's had a, a store up in... Up in they, uh, they had their own Go store Hill. there in uh, Office Pleasant, Street. Pleasant View yeah. at... Uh, uh, school and uh, Wellman Street there, and uh, the uh, stables were out back. I think they used to have eight or ten husses out back. Right. Because my uncle Bud used to take them out and exercise them. Just right, right. And also, uh, what would be of interest uh, to us at this picture that we're looking at is the old fire station, the one that isn't there today. Yeah. But that that really that building itself was moved up School Street towards Cabot, and it's uh, still standing there, and uh, it's uh, it used is, as a home. It, uh, in its place, they yeah. have put the stone structure yep. up years and years ago, which yep. today is a pet shop. Yes, of the yes, yeah. No longer used as a fire station. And of course, when they did erect that uh, building there, uh, like I said way back, uh, it was primarily a social club. Right. Secondly, it was a firefighting organization, and uh, they made sure that there was plenty of room up in the attic. So uh, actually, it was, it was in a Ripley quote there one time, the only firehouse in, in the uh, country that went for three floors. Most of the other buildings that had more than, you know, three or more floors, yep. they'd break it up for two floors. Yep. but. Uh, I, I don't know where the pole went to. It's not down there now. I imagine yeah. someone's yeah. got that. Well, oh, look at that. To, change, <laughs> <laughs> to change the subject just a bit, uh, in the course of your duties, of course, you're, you're out trying to prevent fires, and uh, should they occur, you're uh, trying to uh, keep people from getting hurt or being hurt and injured and so forth, in addition to containing the fires. But uh, animals also play a... Uh, a factor, or have played a factor in, in some of the fire fire reports that I've read. And Bob, you were telling us that uh, in your long soldier during the years of mm -hmm. being a fireman, that you had some encounters with animals. Well, I think animals. we, I think all three of us did. Uh, I think we all encountered dogs falling through ice in the winter time, and cats up trees, and I. Uh, 
took a skunk's head out of a salmon can one day and uh, <laughs> wrapped a, a family of raccoons out of a chimney. And we used in summertime we frequently would get calls to remove bats from houses. But one of the weirdest ones I ran into was we had a fire in the motel on Cabot Street one evening and the, the apartment was chock block full of smoke. Couldn't see much, so Bill uh, Minigan and myself were on our knees trying to crawl along, trying to find the seat of the fire. It, we came to a glass case, and we figured at first it was, you know, an aquarium, fish aquarium. On a closer look, we looked in there, and there's a five foot python staring back at us. <laughs> well, you, you should have seen us two. Who get out the door first? Evacuate. <laughs> yeah. All well and ended well, though. Yeah. yeah. You know, there was nothing more than, uh, I think, a overheated coffee pot or food yeah. on the stove or something like sure. that. Sure. Joel, how about yourself? Have you... Nothing as dramatic as that. Maybe a couple of cats on a tree that we rescue a cat and we stop that and said we figured the cat will get down when he's hungry. Sure. And sure. Dogs and in the water. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. How about how about animals, George, coming after you uh, when you're in the middle of trying to contain a fire? I imagine that would be an exciting time for a dog or whatever uh, to I've work. never had any bad experience with animals after me. Yeah. No. Well. I know but these fellows uh, Yeah, I got bitten down them. Uh, down in the Lynch Park one day. Walked by the dog, he was just as friendly as anything. He was a nice little dog. The minute I turned my back to him, he took a nip out of the back of my leg. <laughs> Showing you how friendly he really yeah. was. Huh? Never trust a smiling dog. <laughs> how about yourself, Bill? Uh, well, o over the years, uh, you run into, I, I think, uh, I'm looking back at one particular case where we got a call for a kitten that was caught in between in the, in the wall in the partition of the wall and gosh we, we were trying to locate it and the woman said, open it up open it up we'd open up a hole in this wall I, I don't know how many dozens of holes you know the, every time we tried oh the cat would travel some other place <laughs> oh gosh almighty so Finally, I says, well, look, leave some food out there. But sure enough, the next morning she called up, oh, the cat come out to get the food. Everything is fine, you know. <laughs> Did I tell you a time about M Mrs. Slocum called me up about her cat up in the tree? <laughs> Let's hear it, Bob. <laughs> well, I don't. That's the, well, Mrs. Slocum called me one time and had a cat up in the tree come down and get it. So they said, go down and see what you can do for the poor woman. She's all upset. So I put the ladder up and I climb up the top of the ladder and just as I made a grab of Mrs. Slocum's pussy, that cat came back at me scratching and clawing. <laughs> I finally got it tucked under my arm and I brought it down the ladder. I turned it over to Mrs. Slocum. As far as I know, she never had any more trouble with her pussy. <laughs> John. Uh, speaking of fires on Cabot Street, uh, you did you attend the commercial block fire? Back yes, I did. Yes, I did. That was I, a real holocaust. It wiped out the whole block there, didn't it? <laughs> as well, we see it today, anyway. When I came down the street, I could see a lot of smoke bellowing across the street. And I knew I had a, a good-sized fire there. I knew the building pretty well. So uh, I called for a lot of help when I got there. And life was, no, life was uh, all taken care of. Not too much life, so it was just a yeah. matter of uh, putting the fire out and stop it from uh, spreading. Containing it. Containing it. It started in the rear and it got control of the cock lock. That, the building is built to burn. We have a few more left in Beverly. And uh, I use uh, some protection on Thompson's furniture stores as an exposure. And I had some people inside the, the store, the furniture store, to see that fire didn't get through the walls. Yeah. But just a, a defense fire. Yeah. Uh, that building had a lot of history to it, though, did it, Don Bob? That commercial block building. They used to hold dances up there and, and uh, various forms of entertainment. Now, stag parties. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, we lost a firefighter there, George Monroe. Uh, Yo, had absolutely. a heart attack in, a, in the back of the building. Taking the, he was a Yo. call fireman. Yep. Yeah, We're going to talk about some of the deceased members in just yeah. a moment, uh, George. 
but the uh, uh, commercial building itself was a quite a historical the, uh, I think place. the Knights of Pythias uh, right. were located in there and a couple of other organizations and uh, they, had, they had had one good fire in there years before so uh, and you know back in those days uh, they'd, they'd leave a lot of those burnt timbers in there and just cover them up so if a fire did take hold yeah. Back uh -huh. why it would really go. And like George said, it was built to burn. Mm. That type of a building. We, we got a few more in Beverly. Not many more, I don't think, in Beverly. That yeah. type. Balloon type construction. It goes right from the cellar right up to mm. the roof. We, we alluded to this in earlier programs, but you can't help wondering how the whole town and towns just like us would have not have gone up in, in flames uh, with, with all of the fireplaces and the. Uh, even before the, the electricity, the gas lights and the candle lights and so forth. I mean, these buildings were, were really fire traps. The way they burnt. <laughs> the way else to look <laughs> well, at yeah, it. Yeah, you can. Of course, New England, uh, from from an overall picture, uh, New England is one of the worst spots for fire because uh, because of the type of construction and the closeness of them, and so forth. Uh, if one building really takes off, then you've got the buildings in the rear, the buildings on the side of it, and so forth. And uh, you see, this is where the country originated sure. in, in New England. Yep. And as yeah. time progressed, why uh, the building codes changed a little. They were a little bit better, but our buildings are already up, are already here. We we're occupying them. So uh, <clears throat> you, you had a built-in potential. Yep for conflagrations, and uh, this happens at times in yeah. different cities and towns. Fireplaces go with Bob in every room in the old days? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, you've got to realize uh, when they built New England, we had the lumber here. We had the trees, and it was much cheaper to build with wood than it was a brick or stone. So in this part of the country, the majority of our buildings are wood construction. You go down south and the southwest there, brick or adobe or uh, s uh, stone or masonry, but uh, New England is uh, unique because they have, I think, more uh, wood frame buildings than any other part of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think maybe it's time to allude to that uh, question, uh, Joe. We were going to discuss the deceased numbers of, uh, of the department fellows that had have lost their lives along the way in terms of uh, working and, and so forth. Uh, and we, we did talk about Mr. Monroe, who uh, had a heart attack and oh, passed on as a result of a commercial yeah, yeah. block fire. That's true, yes. And Bill, you have kind of a list there of fellows that you might want to you know, mention. There was uh, Roger Boardman, uh, Church in the Coal Fire, yep. and uh, George Monroe, as we just mentioned, the commercial block, and Bob Kelly at Marty's Fire, and Bill Riley and uh, my brother Bob McPherson. I hope we didn't leave anybody out. No, yeah. Yeah. I hope not. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, that those are the fellows who didn't make it, and, and many, many more suffered have suffered serious injuries oh. over the years in doing uh, what their what their job is all about. And, uh, well, okay, now uh, let's get back to some lighter things here. We were talking uh, before we taped about the uh, hook and ladder truck, as it used to be called in the old days, I believe, coming out of various streets, coming out of Central, let's say, on the fly. And uh, there's an alarm that uh, come in and they're off to the, f the fire, wherever it may be. And uh, you were telling me some pretty, I think, humorous situations, particularly coming out of Abbott Street. Let's start with Abbott Street, shall we? And, uh, what would happen if, if they had to make that right turn on to Cabot Street? Well, if they, as Bob had mentioned before, if they made that right turn on to Cabot Street, they had to be awful careful that they didn't get caught in the trolley car tracks because if they did, that was it. They, they were stuck, and like Bob said, they'd uh, have a crowbar that they'd throw in front so it'd lift it up and move it out of the way. But uh, they, they also had a record uh, when they'd get on Bow Street and turn on the Rantoul Street, uh, usually it was the right turn that uh, uh, played havoc with them there. There are a number of times that they didn't quite make the turn and they wound up on the 
in the <laughs> display case of Robinson's Plumbing Company right on the corner there. Yeah. And uh, they, they, uh, that, that was uh, the, the uh, I don't know what they call it, the Ajax there, uh, or Knox, Knox, I guess it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. With a one wheeler. They, yeah. they had tr trouble. There was a wheel on the front where you turn it one way or the other, and, and uh, two wheels back here and one wheel up front. And uh, it was very easy to lose control because yeah. there was a grade coming down on Bow Street. And if it was wintertime, any snow or ice there, right. you, you were bound to wind up. Uh, one side of the building was Robertson Plumbing, the other side was a uh, vulcanizing uh, tire company there. Right. And George, the poor fellow who had to do the rear steering, he had sat out there with all exposed to all the weather. <laughs> That's changed now. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any more tillers, do they? Now in a modern uh, truck, I don't think they no, have any more tillers. No, I don't tillers. think so. No. But the tiller man was yeah. the man on the back. You know, he yeah. controlled the rear wheels. Uh -huh. The front part of the ladder truck was a, a semi-tractor, you know. It would pivot right behind the uh, driver's seat. So when they go out onto Cabot Street and turn right to go north, uh, if the tiller man overcompensated, when after he made the car, instead of being in line with the tractor, he'd be off to one side, <laughs> like a crab going down the street sideways. The truck would be coming. <laughs> they wiped out the police. <laughs> there was a police box in Ellis Square. Yeah, they great. wiped that out one time, and ever since that, when the policeman was doing duty, traffic duty in the square, and he saw the ladder truck coming, he'd run out of the box onto the sidewalk. <laughs> Can you blame him? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you don't tell uh, 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 George, back in the 60s again, it seemed like the 60s was a period of time when a lot of major fires uh, did occur. The South School, yeah. which was at that time in retirement, burned flat to the ground. You, you were there. That was one of my, yeah, one of my uh, fellow jobs, I guess you want to call it. That was happening around midnight, and I get down there, it looked like it started right in the front entrance and had pretty well control of the whole building. Yeah. So there was another defense job surrounding it and hoping the sparks wouldn't travel any other place. Yeah. Pictures that we're looking at on the screen now were taken by John Hurley, and he told me that he had taken the, the photographs just days before the, the fire. So. What we're seeing is the last of the school just before it went up in, 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 yeah. in flames. And Bob, that was another building that was built to burn, I, I would oh, say. Yeah, yeah. As, right. as were all those old schoolhouses that used yeah. to be. And churches. Uh, and churches also. The old churches. Yeah. Was there a suspect uh, of, of arson there, George? Uh, I would say so. The way it was started, in the front entrance, and no source of ignition. I could. Uh, that it, you know, yep. was helped along, I would say that one, my personal opinion, yep. FYI. Yep. Well, now we're looking on the screen, Bob, at a picture of a, a, a dog that once belonged to you by the name of Duchess, I believe. Is yeah, that, is that's that true? Right. That yeah. you, it's a Dalmatian dog and you brought her down to the yeah. station yeah. for a little exposure down there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bill, you had a story about a Dalmatian dog that took place years earlier. Yeah, the, the old uh, <laughs> I had a dog, Sparky, there that used to yeah. hang out down Engine 2, and uh, Jack McLean used to drive Engine 2. He was the brother of Mayor McLean, and he, uh, he and the dog got along great, and uh, uh, he pulled up in front of a building one day, and I guess Wittenhagen, who was chief at the time, got a little upset with Jack and said, no more dogs on the fire apparatus. Well. I guess that lasted about two days, and they got a call for a house fire down on Front Street, and it was a smoky, smoky fire. It was an old, old house, and uh, the neighbors were yelling that there was an old timer in there. They couldn't account for him, and lo and behold, the, the dog got in there, and the dog found him, one of the bedrooms there, and, and uh, Wittenhagen, uh, who was chief, showed up, and uh, the fellows get in there and uh, got this fella out. And, got him to the hospital, and when Wittenhagen found out it was the dog that found the fella in there, why, everything was all right. After that, the dog had a free ticket. He could ride on the okay. engine, too, any time at all. <laughs> <laughs> and you were telling uh, me that uh, there was a, one of the dogs down there could tell with the, with the alarm. Oh, that was Sparky, the, uh, the dog. He, uh, 
he would know what, when the tests would come in, you know, 6.30 in the morning, 6.30 at night, and 11.45 in the morning. When the alarm did come in, he would open up the two trap doors by the pole, uh -huh. and he'd go and he'd look at that thing, and, the, and when the doors would fly open, the pole would be there because he was still trying to figure out to his dying days who it was there that opened up the doors because he couldn't see them. Yeah. And of course, it was just a little catch me mechanism uh -huh. there was activated by the alarm system. <laughs> John, we're going back to 1922 and looking at a picture that hangs down in the Central Station, loaned to us courtesy of Lewis Bennett. And I believe there's a duplicate up on the North Beverly Station. And this shows the array of firemen that stood out in front of my... I, uh, well, they were down at Dade Street Beach, I believe it was, for a particular day of, uh, of uh, ceremonies down there. And uh, we see among uh, some of the fellows here, we see Chief uh, Grant is in this picture. and. Uh, uh, Cressy was uh, up and coming at that time, and it's the public cover, and uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, firemen from years and years back. Uh, marvelous picture. Which leads me, John, to, uh, it just popped into my mind, what about firemen's busters? I, I've heard about them, I've been to a few, they, they, <laughs> they've had them down at Lynch Park, I know, over the years. Uh, I don't think uh, I can tell you too much about it. That's well, Don, Don, when they had the carnival down there, Red, yeah. uh, as yeah. a kid, it was a must for me, and I'm sure Bob was there. Yeah. And, of course, uh, we'd get a few freebies there, being the sons of firemen. Yeah. There. We wouldn't have to get the nickel or the dime up to take a chance on this or that. And then about 7 o'clock, they, uh, they, they would have a uh, contest. Uh, they'd have a uh, rig all set up, probably about 10, 12 feet in the air, and... Uh, uh, they'd have two cots up there, and uh, there'd be a couple of teams from Beverly, uh, namely uh, John Palmer and uh, Freddie Gould. Uh, they were callmen at the time, and uh, they were brothers-in-law. And uh, we'd have some other uh, crews from out of town and so forth. And uh, of course, there was a prize for first, second, and third on timing of uh, they'd strike the the bell and they'd jump out of bed, jump out of the night hitch, get down the pole, and hook up the hose to the hydrant there and turn it on and get some water out through the nozzle. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it, it was a great time. Yeah. Bob, was this more for show uh, or was this part of the firefighting procedure? That, were the firemen oh, trying try to put on a show, presentation? This is a, one way the Relief Association used to make money. They would have games of chance down there and rides for the kiddies and uh, uh, the uh, the fireman's uh, contest was more or less the highlight of the show. That was the main event. Where they had uh, uh, fire departments competing from all over the North Shore down there. And it, uh, it was quite, quite a time. It was lighted at night, and I, they may even have fireworks, you know, and things like that. But the, the tradition of fireman's busters goes way back in history, though. Oh, yes, it goes, goes way, way back. back yeah. and, and it was a form, I'm sure, of getting the community out, John, to get getting Probably. people out yeah. together in and in a, maybe even a goodwill gesture from the fire yeah, department. A lot of pride and rivalry involved. Yeah, I know it. I talked to the fellas down in Essex and said, boy, you better be careful, you know, <laughs> if they're competing. They still have it uh, around <laughs> like we used to. So I, 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 there's I, a big one in Marblehead this summer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Enormous muster. Yeah. That's out of my experience. I have uh, that. <laughs> today when somebody refers to the muster, though, they, they uh, more or less uh, think about the hand tubs. Well, that's what yeah, it is, yeah. the hand, tub hand tubs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back right after World War II, we used to have uh, uh, contests on hose laying and so forth, and uh, uh, there was an outfit in Danvers that used to go, well, they'd go to Connecticut, they'd go to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and different places in Massachusetts. They had their own, they had their own fire truck. The yeah. guys all chipped in. Uh, Brother Bob and I were members of the outfit, and, uh, and we used to go all over the place, and uh, uh, we had a...